Shalom Rabbi, and thank you for taking the time for this part of my program, Profiles of Faith. We are here today on August 8th, the 16th of Av, with Rabbi Haskell Lukstein at Keila Jeshurun Synagogue and Ramaz Yeshiva Building in New York City. Rabbi, how do you prefer to be called? I guess Rabbi Lukstein. Rabbi Haskell Lukstein served for 57 years as the rabbi of Congregation Keilat Jeshurun, one of the nation's most prominent synagogues, where he is currently Rabbi Emeritus, and what some would consider much more important, Rabbi Lukstein served as principal of Ramaz, a modern Orthodox Jewish day school started by his father, Rabbi Joseph Lukstein, where he served for almost half a century, until two years ago when he stepped down at the age of 83. By extension, it is hard to imagine New York and American modern orthodoxy without Rabbi Lukstein at its helm. Obviously, Rabbi Lukstein has many other accomplishments, both as a Zionist, leading an uncompromising, passionate support of Israel, as a social activist, where it is hard to see the transformation of Soviet Jewry without his leadership, and as a modern orthodox centrist who advocates for a more open orthodoxy, Avat Israel, especially Jews we don't agree with. But to those who know him, is a warm, inclusive, Baal Chesed, generous rabbi who wants every Jew to get closer. Rabbi, we have so much to talk about. We'll have to skip a lot, but my theme is about tradition and its transmission through the generation. I know that you enjoyed a rich Jewish tradition at your home, from your grandfather-in-law, Rabbi Moses, Zevulun Margolis, to your father, Rabbi Joseph Lukstein, and your mother, Gertrude, whose advice you have followed even as a rabbi. Can you tell us about your family? Well, Rabbi Margolis, uh, the Ramaz, Rav Moshe Zvulun, was actually my great-grandfather. He was my mother's grandfather. And he was the rabbi of this congregation, KJ, from 1906 to 1936 when he passed away. My father came in 1923 as the English-speaking assistant to Rabbi Margolis, and three years later he married Rabbi Margolis' granddaughter. So I really didn't know Rabbi Margolis well. Uh, I was four and a half when uh, he died, and while I was close to him, I actually have no recollection of him, except in stories that my father told me about him. And to some extent, I've modeled my life after those stories about the Ramaz. My major influences at home were, of course, my father and my mother, and a grandfather, my mother's father, who was born in America in 1882, one year after his parents immigrated from Krakow. Uh, that grandfather, who only went through the eighth grade because he had to help support his family, was a major influence on my life in terms of my music, my love of davening, my love of Kriyas HaTorah. I got all of that from him. From my father, I learned how to be a mensch, how to be a baltzdaka, to be concerned about other Jews, how they are developing as religious Jews, how they are functioning as human beings. Um, and I learned, I guess, from my father, the principle of avdus, servitude. He used to say that a rabbi is an eved la'avde Hashem, a servant to the servants of God. That's what I saw in my home, and that's what I learned also in 23 years when I was my father's assistant, from 1958 until my father passed away in uh, 1979, actually 21 years uh, of watching him closely in action and being mentored by him. You became a rabbi in full position at 77? In 1979, I ceased being assistant or associate rabbi. It didn't really make any difference what the title was. And I became the rabbi of KJ. So I was uh, essentially a rabbi in KJ from 1958 until I became emeritus in 2015, uh, 16. You were also principal of uh, Ramaz? Well, in 1965, I became principal of Ramaz. I had been teaching in Ramaz from uh, 1958 on, 
and then coordinator of uh, Judaic studies. And then uh, in 1967, my father felt he could no longer be three things at once. Yeah. Rabbi of the shul, principal of the school, and president of Bar Ilan University. He had to give up one of them. And he decided that I might be ready to take over Ramaz, and he became a consultant to Ramaz, uh, and I became principal of the school. In interest of full disclosure, I have to share that my wife, Tani, uh, credits you, Rabbi Luxton, and your school with putting her, and by extension our family, on the path to observant Judaism. Her Ramaz education from the age of five in kindergarten through high school gave her a love and passion for religious modern Orthodox lifestyle, which she then introduced to me, and which is now subsequently how we raised our four sons and many grandchildren. I remember Tani very well and very fondly. Can you tell us please about yourself as a child? You attended first grade in Ramaz when your father just established the school. Yeah, I was five years old. Uh, my father started the school in 1937. It was either Ramaz or PS6. And he had sent my older sister, who was five years older than I, Natalie, uh, to PS6, where she flourished, but she never got the kind of Jewish education that he felt uh, his children should get and the children of our congregation uh, as well. Ramaz was started as a different kind of day school or yeshiva. We now call ourselves the yeshiva. Originally, we were called Ramaz Academy. It had to be fashionable on the Upper East Side, because the people whom my father was trying to attract were Upper East Side and Upper West Side Jews and Jews from the Bronx. And these were people who were just as happy to send their kids to public school or to the fancy private schools. And therefore, he tried to make Ramaz the best school it possibly could be. He felt he was in competition with Horace Mann and with Riverdale as well as the public schools, which in those days were absolutely outstanding. And gradually he was able to build it. We started out with six kids in 1937. You were one of them. I was one of the six. And the daughter of the shamash of our congregation, Mr. Adler, who taught me everything I know in Kriyat Torah and in Tefillah as a, as a Baal Tefillah, I learned it all from just listening to Mr. Adler. She, Shirley Adler, was another member of our class, and Naomi Jacobs, whose mother became the assistant to the principal of the school, also members of the shul. She was a third member of that class. When you grew up, there was no modern orthodoxy as we know it today. Can you take us to the Jewish life in your times and help us understand how was it for Jews who weren't what we call now Haredim? Well, I never knew anything but modern orthodoxy. I was sort of born into it. My father wanted to create an orthodox Judaism that would be meaningful and attractive to Jews living on Park Avenue and on the Upper East Side and the Upper West Side. That's what I knew. I also knew anti-Semitism. Uh, I grew up at a time when 85th Street and Lexington Avenue, the, the neighborhood was known as Yorkville, was a hotbed of German anti-Semitism. My father always said to us, a yarmulke is an indoor garment. Mm. And it wasn't because he was ashamed of the yarmulke. It was because he was afraid for us that we could get beaten up if we were walking around the streets with a kippah. So we would be encouraged to wear a baseball hat or something like that, but not a kippah. And when I left the school doors, if I was carrying a Hebrew book, I carried it with the Hebrew uh, side, the cover, against my chest. I did not carry the book in an obviously Jewish way. And while we were not at all ashamed of who we were, we didn't want to get, uh, we didn't want to be victims of, uh, anti-Semitism, which in the late 1930s and early 1940s was rampant in America and in our neighborhood. 
What was the exact dividing line in the 40s and 50s between modern orthodoxy and conservative Judaism? Because all of this Upper East Side and otherwise people who were working on Shabbos because they had to make a living had either gone to a conservative shul or to what we call now uh, modern orthodoxy, but at the time I don't know what it was called. So what is the dividing line? Well, remember that in addition to my influence from home, my father and my mother and my mother's father about whom I spoke and indirectly Rabbi Margolis Zechat Tzadik Levrocha, I also had another major influence in Rabbi Joseph B. Soloveitchik in whose shear I had the privilege of sitting. It's when I went to Yeshiva University after graduating from Columbia College. I graduated in January of 1953, and uh, I entered the Rav Shear, and I was there for four years through 1957-58. Those were the four most formative years of my life. And I learned there the difference between Orthodox Judaism of any variety, modern or ultra, whatever, and conservative Judaism was an uncompromising commitment to halacha. That's what Rav Soloveitchik taught. Yikov hadin esahar. You have to be committed to halacha. And it was a wake-up call for me and for my fellow students at yeshiva. That's why he made such a fuss over the mechitza. He felt... The Mechitza was the Maginot line of uh, the Orthodox community. If we would go to a shul without a Mechitza, we would become conservative. If we insisted on a Mechitza, we could preserve Orthodox Judaism. There were reasons why he felt the Mechitza was so important, but ultimately it was the commitment to halacha. That commitment is what differentiates Orthodox Judaism from everything else, as far as I'm concerned, right through today. At the same time, the Upper East Side Jews that came to your shul were people who didn't follow all the edicts of the Holocaust. That's correct. The other principle that I learned from my father was not to be judgmental and to be open and tolerant towards and of all Jews, people would say to my father, you know, Rabbi, I'm not religious. And my father would say, yet. <laughs> and I agree with that position. And furthermore, a half a loaf is better than none as far as I'm concerned. And if a person comes to shul on Shabbos and is not meticulous in halacha the rest of the week, I hope he'll become or she will become meticulous. But I'm happy to have them come to shul on Shabbos. There were people who I knew in the community who were in businesses where half their business was on Saturday, and yet they sent their children to Ramaz. I used to refer to them as the non-observant Orthodox. And I knew, I'm now thinking of one specific person, I knew that when that person would retire, he would be in shul every single Shabbos. And that's exactly what happened. The question that I have is not about you or your family or the shul here in particular, but bring us to the time if a Jew worked on Shabbos and because he had to, to make a living apparently, why would one go to become conservative and one would go to become what we call now modern orthodox? What was the dividing line? What made them choose one versus the other when it was very similar? Well, I would say there would be two dividing lines. One might be where that person came from. Sometimes a person grew up in an Orthodox home and uh, acculturated and entered into a uh, life where working on Shabbos was, according to that person, necessary. Why would the person come to our shul, let's say on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, or on Pesach, Shavuos, and Sukkot, especially for Yizker, why wouldn't the person go to the Park Avenue Synagogue two blocks away? Uh, 
possibly because that person came from an Orthodox home and felt that the Orthodox shul was the real one. A second reason had to do with my father. My father was a tremendous attraction for Jews, uh, Orthodox and non-Orthodox. My father, for example, uh, was meticulous about how the uh, base medrash, the chapel of the shul, looked. He used to tell the students in practical rabbinics in yeshiva, uh, the daily services, that's where they put all the sidurim that need to be repaired and the talesim that are torn. They keep the good sidurim for the Shabbos crowd. He said that's exactly the wrong way to do it. He said the daily service is the entree for people to the shul. They come there to say Kaddish. They should find it to be the most aesthetically appealing. The best sidurim in the best condition and the best talesim should be there. My father had a knack of attracting people to the shul. He was a gifted speaker, perhaps sui generis as a, an orator. You learned He's, it from him. Well, I tried to learn as best I possibly could. Uh, I could go on for 50 years more and not be able to shine his shoes. My father was a uniquely gifted preacher. He spoke extemporaneously, not unprepared, but extemporaneously. And his choice of language and phraseology and power and oratory and content were amazing. And he attracted a lot of people because of his preaching and teaching. He lived at the time of a lot of other giants, such as Heschel and, and Kaplan. Well, and, and, and Hill Silver, Silver and Stephen uh, S. Wise. So how did he connect with all of this giants in his well, generation? Uh, he, he connected and he taught me to connect. My father loved all Jews, except a Jew who didn't love another Jew. That Jew, he didn't want to have anything to do with it. With, But any Jew my father loved, he was a close friend of Stephen S. Wise, who actually was his campaign manager when my father was elected president of the New York Board of what was called Jewish Ministers at that time, became the New York Board of Rabbis. It was an interesting story. I think it was 1942. And the next president was supposed to be a reform rabbi, Rabbi Shachtel, I think was his name, who was a leader in the American Council for Judaism, which was an anti-Zionist group. And Stephen S. Wise was the head of the American Jewish Congress, which was very uh, Zionist. And Stephen S. Wise did not want Rabbi Shachtel to become the president of the New York Board of Jewish Ministers. And he came to my father and he said, Joe, you're actually out of order in running for president, but I will be your campaign manager because I want a Zionist as the president of the New York Board of Jewish Ministers. And my father became that. And I knew that that was my father's attitude. And eventually, when I entered the rabbinate, I joined the New York Board of Rabbis, and I became president of the New York Board of Rabbis, and then chairman of the National Rabbinic Cabinet of UJA Federation, UJA actually, and I learned so much from my non-Orthodox colleagues. I believe, as Rabbi Aaron Lichtenstein, Zichron Olibracha, put it once, that in all the movements, there are people genuinely in search of the Rabona Shalom. You just have to find them and learn what you can learn from them and teach what you can teach to them. And we all got along very well. Part of the attraction, I think, of, of building Ramaz, from what I heard at the time, was that Jews did not have to look like those in now what we call Borough Park or Brooklyn or the Black Hat. And there is some hint to, because many of them came from Europe, uh, something to do with the Enlightenment, reminding us of the 19th century German period. Can you 
direct me in this there in, in yeah, comment I, on this? I think I don't I don't agree with you. Um with respect, Ramaz was modeled after the Torah im Derech Eretz movement of Rav Shamshan Rafal Hirsch, except he was not a real Zionist. Uh, and we were always very Zionist, even before the establishment of the state, perhaps especially before and certainly thereafter. It wasn't that we shouldn't look like them. It was People thought that only poor Jews went to yeshiva. My father wanted to make a day school attractive to Jews who were in all economic classes. Uh, and he also felt very strongly that if you spend from 8.30 in the morning until 4 o'clock in Judaic studies and then learn three hours of general studies, what were called secular studies uh, in those days, uh, you were giving short shrift to secular studies. He wanted to create an integrated school where Judaic studies and general studies would be taught throughout the day, alternately, where the teachers would be full-time faculty, where you could grow up to be a an Orthodox Jew, and at the same time, learned of and committed to the values of Western civilization when they didn't clash with your Judaism. And I think that's what he created. I feel myself very much at home in the world of Western civilization. But of course, I am first and foremost uh, a Ben Torah and a Shomer Torah mitzvos. That's what he wanted to create. And the way he went about it was, first of all, to make the secular education or the general education, as we called it, excellent and the Jewish education excellent. And to somehow merge the two so that one person came out, not a Jew in the morning and a guy in the afternoon, but one learned, committed, human being. And, and that succeeded beyond our greatest dreams because um, that type of education has brought Jews to prominence in all fields in America where colleges that wouldn't have admitted Jews once and the Ivies had uh, been forced to bring them in and I think it's that type of education that has helped Jews become so influential in our society. I think what it did was it preserved Judaism for the general population. Look, the conservative movement established Solomon Schechter schools that were modeled after a modern Orthodox day school. The reform tried to start it too. It, it didn't last so well because it's expensive and parents have to be committed right. to this kind of life to spend fortunes on the education of their children. The conservative movement still has a good number of Solomon Schechter schools. It's hard to maintain them. But as far as orthodoxy is concerned, there's a reason why our synagogue uh, 50 years ago or 60 years ago used to have 200 people on a Shabbos. And today, on a normal Shabbos, it can have five to 600 people. And when it's not such a normal Shabbos as a bar mitzvah, it could be 800 people. There's a reason. The reason is the day school movement. In years back when I was growing up, we had many, many three-day-a-year Jews. <laughs> and the Shabbos attendance was small. Today, thank God, uh, we have largely the graduates of day schools, or certainly the parents of day school children, uh, in our case, Ramaz. There's, there's a commitment that's come out of the day school movement. Synagogues did not save Judaism in America. Day schools saved Judaism in America. And synagogues have thrived because of the success of day schools. Okay. That's something that my father saw back in the 1930s in the Depression. Uh, remember, Ramaz was founded in 1937, which was... In known in American history as the Roosevelt Recession. It was a recession on top of the Depression. There were 
15 million Americans out of work. That was one out of every 10 in the population. And the shul didn't want to start the school. They said, Rabbi, give us time to recover. And my father said, no, I, I didn't come here uh, just to teach shiurim and give sermons. I came here because I want to start a school. It was people like him who made the difference for Judaism in America. There's no question in my mind. Camps played a very big role, but camps were built on the day school movement. Now it is said that camps are the most influential in young kids. Camps are integrated and they don't go home to some halfway Judaism, they practice a full well, they, yes, 30 they, look, days or 20 days of full Jewish life without... A camp is a very, very important experience. I, I spent many years in Camp Masad, which had a tremendous influence on my life in terms of my spirit, my, my being concerned with other people's Judaism and encouraging them, my love of the Hebrew language, but without the day school base, Masad would not have succeeded. I believe fervently in the value of camps that practice and teach Shmirat Mitzvot, love of Zionism, uh, love of Jewish song. Uh, that's all the, the things that I learned in Masad and it molded my life a lot. But that has to go along with a solid Jewish education because if you just learn the spirit and you don't have the solid Jewish education, you're an Amhaaretz. And lo Amhaaretz chasid. It's hard to have Judaism survive in America with pure Amharatzis. You need learned Jews. Camp, I sent all my children to camp uh, and to those kinds of camps mostly Masad when, uh, when I was sending my children and my, my children then send their children to camps like Masad. Uh, they're very, very important, but it's all built on a base of a Jewish education. Ramaz was known, especially since it started in the Upper East Side, as the school for the rich, but you and your father have created the philanthropic system that really supported kids from everywhere, from all the five boroughs, and please tell us about how you did it. My father always felt that any student who is eligible to get into Ramaz, and for whom we have room in the school, is entitled to a Ramaz education and money doesn't stand in the way. There's no such thing as a person being able to handle a Ramaz education and want to go to Ramaz and doesn't come because of uh, the tuition. It's our job to provide tuition for students who come from families who cannot afford the very heavy load, especially in today's world where it's exploded. Um, that's another subject entirely. But our policy has always been that uh, a child gets into Ramaz, that's number one. Now, paying for it, if you can pay for it, uh, you absolutely should pay for it. And if you can't, and you can demonstrate that you can't, it's our job to provide scholarships. Today, uh, about a third, a little more than a third of the Ramaz population is on some form of scholarship. We're giving out over $6 million in scholarship today. That's why we try to raise money. I believe that is the job of the uh, American Jewish community now is to create endowments and ways to make it possible for every parent who wants to give their child a day school education to do so, because that's the future of Judaism uh, in America. I can tell you that people have come into this office to say, I just lost my job. I cannot afford the tuition in Ramaz anymore. I don't have real savings and I can just about put food on the table. And until I find another job, I can't uh, afford, you know, what am I gonna do? Where, wh what's gonna happen to my children? I've said the same thing to every single parent who's come in that way, and many have come in. 
of said, we are in the business of educating children. We're not in the business of collecting tuition. Obviously, we can't run a school without tuition because we couldn't pay teacher salaries. But our primary business is educating children. Your children will be in Ramaz just as they were when you were paying full tuition. Well, now you have uh, more time to be a full-time fundraiser for that cause. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, unfortunately, I found out that Rabbi Emeritus means fundraiser. Uh, so I, I do have to do that. Yes, no question about it. It's phenomenal. I, I want to honor you for this amazing accomplishment because I know personally and other people who have uh, been raised with Jewish education because people such as you have made it possible. Going back to your childhood, between your great influence from your father and before you attended the Rav's Shears, growing up in a society that was a little difficult to be Jewish, did you have any doubts, conflicts? Did you ever think, why do I have to do it? Did you ever think maybe we could do it a little less? Not to d diminish any commitment, but a lot no. of people... No, it's an interesting question. I went through my own crisis period, I think, in Ramaz in the eighth grade, where I was the most rambunctious child in the class. I think if I hadn't been fortunate enough that my father started a high school, I'm not sure I could have gotten into any uh, uh, school. Uh, I, was, I was so mischievous, and uh, I could use a stronger word. It helps me, by the way, when I see an eighth grader applying to Ramaz, and the, he has a mixed kind of background in the eighth grade, I think to myself, about myself, and I think, you know what? Don't judge a person by the way they are in eighth grade. Whatever the reasons were, but I never had actual doubts religiously. I, I was never a rebel. Perhaps that's because my parents never demanded obedience from me. My father modeled for me. My mother modeled for me and for my sister. And therefore, I just grew up very naturally. I didn't have a crisis of faith in my life. I'm not saying that that's normal. It may be a little bit abnormal, but that was never really an issue for me. And then when I got to yeshiva and entered the Rav Shear and, and, and then started listening to him in philosophy, I found out why everything makes sense. I absolutely found out why everything makes sense. And it just reinforced where I was uh, before. So I'll ask you, question in the reverse. When do you remember yourself feeling God independently, not just as a son of your father or grandson of your grandfather, but feeling God independently for the first time? An epiphany, if there is anything like that. I had no epiphany, but I have to... I, I can't accept fully what you just said. I never felt that I was accepting Judaism because of my father and that it was expected of me. One of the wonderful things that my father did was he never said to me or to my sister, look, you have to do this because you're the rabbi's children. You're obligated to come to shul because it doesn't look nice if you don't come to shul. I never heard that from him. And I believe I never said it to my children either. They all just grew up naturally, whether they felt some kind of an inside feeling, well, I got to do this because I don't want to embarrass my father or my mother. I can't control that. But we never did that to our kids, and my father never did it to me. Um, so I never had an epiphany. I can tell you, I had a moment in my life when I think I became emotionally a Zionist, and that was in Camp Massad when I was 13 years old, and it was Tisha B'Av night, and we sat on the floor in Ulam Bialik. I didn't really know much about what Tisha B'Av was all about. I knew it was a fast day and that I was now 13 and I had to fast even if, if I died, I had to fast. So I was nervous about the fast, but I wasn't really thinking about what the meaning of Tisha B'Av was. And then there was this old man who was reading from the 
uh, Agadot of the Talmud about the destruction of the temple, and he was crying. And I remember being incredibly moved by his crying. I did not understand fully what he was reading, but I knew it was about the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple and the Jewish state. And right there, I think my Zionist soul was born. Uh, it's interesting, the old man was 33 years old. He was Shlomo Schulzinger. To me, as a 13-year-old, he was an old man. But that's who it was, and I think that's where I became emotionally a Zionist. Something else happened to me in Mossad. Two years later, I was in the oldest division in the camp, and the, the counselor who was in charge of tefillah, the services, uh, every morning, uh, wasn't so uh, enamored of getting up early every single morning. So he came to me and asked me, Haskell, would you like to run the services in the weekdays? I'll run it on Shabbos, because Shabbos Shlomo Schulzinger was there, so he certainly had to do this. But he asked me if I'd like to run the service weekdays, and I said yes. And that summer, I did that for about six weeks. And it was the first time in my life that I was ever worried about other people's religious lives. Training for being a rabbi. Were they davening? I never thought of rabbi then, but something happened to me. I suddenly became interested in other people's davening and davening well. Ever the Shem. Yeah, and I remember I came home from camp and I organized what we call the father and son minion for high school boys where on Sunday mornings they came at 9.30 and we davened, and at 10.30 we had breakfast, and at 11 o'clock we played basketball. And this went on for about 20 years. It was the beginning of my interest in what became the rabbinate, and I didn't even know it at the time. So talking back about discovering God independently or not, many Jews look at God as this old man with the beard in the sky. This is... And they said it's kind of still the God for children that they've never grown out of. This olive bed with the honey on top to love. When did you find that more direct relationship with Rabbi Moshul Olam, not as the old man in the sky? In Rav Soloveitchik's shiurim and philosophy lectures, especially in the philosophy lectures. How do you teach that to children who don't have those philosophy Jewish lectures? It's interesting. Just this morning, I was sitting with a balabas from my shul who did not grow up with any Jewish education. And I'm actually learning with him piece by piece, word by word, the sitter, and trying to help him with his Hebrew and everything. And I find that as I'm learning with him in the sitter, I'm giving him not just the Hebrew and the explanation of the words, but I'm giving him the courses that Rav Soloveitchik taught in Shema and in Shmon Esrei, in Tefillah. And just today, while I was learning with him, I said, excuse me for a minute, and I dictated a memo to uh, the heads of the high school in Ramaz saying, I want to spend an hour with each grade in the school going through some of the philosophy of prayer that I learned in Rav Soloveitchik's shir. I've never really done that. You know, in school you're too busy learning courses and studying texts, and you don't necessarily get what I got from the Rav. So I sent that just this morning. And with God's help, uh, I hope they'll find time in the schedule and I will, I will uh, do this. You mentioned the Tisha B'Av in camp. I was very affected last year when I was looking through the Koran keynote oh. and I saw your introduction and it really helped me connect with that year's Tisha B'Av. And when we spoke on the phone, you told me of the story how you went to Israel right after the 1967 and you attended the Tisha B'Av at the Rav Goren's shul. Can you tell us about it? Oh, my heavens. We, it was Erev Tisha B'Av that we arrived in Israel to see the results of the Six-Day War. And we went to Rav Goren's shul for Kinos. 
and it was like a party. It was not what I was used to from Masad, sitting on the floor. Yeah, the people were sitting on the floor, but they were so exhilarated. I understand why. The Messiah had arrived in the Six-Day War. This was, uh, this was the Geula, the redemption. We had Jerusalem for the first time in the That's right, years. and the Kotel and, and everything. And Rav Gorin finished reading Echo and starts to read Kinos, and at a certain point, he just closed the book and said, Mas pick, enough. Let's go. And I was terribly offended. Terribly offended, because to me, Tisha B'Av, back from the age of 13, was Kodesh Kodeshim. This is the Holy of Holies. This was why we got Israel back in 1947, 1948. I was 13 in 1945, because Jews cried for Tisha B'Av. And uh, as Napoleon said, a, a a people that will remember a temple that was destroyed will yet rebuild that temple. But you understood him. He blew the first person to Rabbi to I understood for... Rav Gorin, but I was very, very disappointed. And then the very next year in June, Rav Salavechi gave one of the shiurim that stands out in my head so much I've never had to go back to my notes on it. I just remember exactly what he said why we need Tisha B'Av today in 1968. And he basically answered that question with three answers, which appear in that introduction to the keynote of Corin, uh, the Lukstein edition. And I had the privilege of, of writing that introduction as a memorial to my wonderful and beloved uh, teacher. It's wonderful to have heard it from you directly. It is more than a century since KJ had a non Lukstein rabbi, and your son, Rabbi Joshua Lukstein, is heading now Westchester Day School. And doing a great job. Absolutely. Do you wish he'd continued your legacy? Well, I never put that on him, <laughs> ever. Everybody expected him to. That's right. I think people in the shul did when he was very young, and I think they. They may have uh, frightened him a little bit about that, but he did go to yeshiva on his own and, and uh, got smicha, got a wonderful job in Stamford, Connecticut, uh, right out of yeshiva. The, the rabbi there, Rabbi Aaron Kranz, uh, uh, had just retired, and they were looking for a rabbi, and they couldn't find one yet, so they took Josh Lukstein for a year, and he was... Beloved there, they were crazy about him. Uh, happily, he agreed to come and be my assistant. And I thought the Geula had arrived. <laughs> and he was with me for four years, and the shul loved him, absolutely loved him. But he did not love the pulpit rabbinate. And so he decided to leave the shul. The people in the shul were so upset over it but that's what it is. As I said, people think that between your job as rabbi of KJ and your job as principal of Ramaz, there's no doubt that your principalship is what shaped many generations of uh, Jews. And uh, I think that he made, if, if he had to choose one, I think it's a great job to be a mechanech. Oh, I'm thrilled with what he's doing. He, he, he left, he went into the fundraising uh, aspect in Judaism, and he was doing very, very well. But somebody at Westchester Day School thought of him as a possible leader of that school. They thought out of the box, and I believe they discovered gold. And I'm thrilled that he found his niche because he's, he loves children, he loves teachers, he even loves parents. <laughs> And that's terrific. It's a, an unbeatable combination. To a different direction. In the late 60s, just as you started your tenure as principal of Ramaz School, the New York Times devoted an article to a sermon in which you described the Talmud as the model for modern civil rights movement or manual, which at the time was the right time to say, to do it. In the sermon, you characterized our Torah as one of the most profound sources for social consciousness during the civil rights era, and went on to explicate the relevance of the Talmud, noting, for example, that it holds that no man 
is free if it does not have economic opportunity or the right to live where it chooses. Right. How did you come up with such amazing insights? Thank you very much for the compliment. Ukrasem dror ba'aretz l'chol yoshevecha and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all the inhabitants thereof. What's what it, it appears on the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia. The word drawer, the Midrash, translates de daire be daire, which means to live. You have to be able to live wherever you want to live. If you cannot, if you have to live in a ghetto, that's not uh, a, a way to live. A, a tzipor drawer means a, a bird that can alight wherever it wants and live there. And that's a principle of the Torah, that you have to be able to live in a reasonable place. Remember, this was the time when the, the uh, Black Revolution was going on. It was a period piece. And I do believe that the Talmud uh, is a source for morality, and civil rights is part of morality, and fairness, and justice, and mishpat echad yelachem v'lager hagor besochachem, one law for everybody, and not one law for whites, and a different law for blacks. It all resonated then very, very much. So in those days, we used to sometimes send in our sermons to the New York Times, and it just so happens they picked this one, and they liked this one. You're very modest. Does it still apply today because a lot of uh, Jews, uh, especially on the conservative side of the uh, economy, advocate cutting social programs for the needy in order to, you know, a lot of ideology about, you know, um, whatever it's called, uh, revitalizing the economy. But how do you respond to that? Well, I certainly don't want to get into politics. <laughs> Uh, at all. I, I do believe in social justice. I believe in uh, fairness. I don't think that Judaism is just about social justice. Uh, when, when people say that Judaism believes in tikkun olam, yes, it does. But tikkun olam, the phrase also has two more words attached to it in our uh, liturgy. Letakein olam b'malchut shaddai. To repair the world in the kingdom of God. Uh, repairing the world is not just social action. Repairing the world is social action with godliness and with the fullness of what Judaism is all about. Uh, I think I've been a liberal all my life. I'm not sure that today's um, leftist ideology is what liberalism is all about. Uh, I think liberalism is about fairness and justice and the dignity of every human being, uh, things in which I believe fervently and I'm ready to fight and struggle, uh, that's where I am. And that's where I think Judaism leads us. Yeah. In 2008, you were selected by Newsweek magazine as the most influential Orthodox pul pulpit rabbi in the United States. But it starts long ago with many acts of leadership. In the 70s, you went to Russia, smuggled Jewish education to refuseniks. You led a co-ed yeshiva. You have been at the forefront of so many firsts in Jewish leadership. All these concepts were groundbreaking, whether you started them or led them. How did you know to do it? Well, first of all, you can't take Newsweek too seriously. I don't know how they came to the conclusion that I was the most influential rabbi in America. I don't think I am. I don't think I ever was. But it's nice to be mentioned. Uh, I don't remember being number one. I remember being number two. But you said I'm number one, so I'm ready to accept that. But regardless uh, of the rating, <laughs> I think it was a lead into my more important question. How did you know how to do it? And more importantly, how can leader figures today know how to make decisions that will be changing and affecting when there's so much risk involved? 
The Torah says very clearly, Lo ta'amod al dam re'echa. Do not stand idly by while your brother's blood is spilled. That means that if a Jew hurts anywhere, it has to hurt every Jew everywhere. Every Jew who's serious about his or her Judaism has to be an activist to help other Jews and ultimately other people, too, who are in trouble. My life changed in September of 1972 when my wife and I went to the former Soviet Union for the first time over the Sukkot festival. We found there Jews who were in great distress and great trouble. I had an uncle who said, make the most of this mission because it could change your life. He was right. It changed my life. I have never been able to be quiet anymore when Jews suffer and have difficulty. Together with colleagues in Ramaz, we created in the school a uh, response to all difficulties of Jews. We're the, we were the first ones to go out on rallies whenever the National Conference or New York Conference on Soviet Jewry called a rally or the UJA or JCRC. We will spend two hours at a rally to help Jews, whether it's Gilad Shalit uh, or whatever it is, and we feel that it's worth 10 hours in a classroom because that's what you remember doing. You could forget a little bit of Gemara or a certain amount of uh, American history, but you don't forget going uh, with all of your friends to uh, protest in behalf of an Israeli being held captive by Hamas. My uh, colleagues in Ramaz know, I have a phrase, never let school interfere with your education. I think I've since heard that it, that it was Mark Twain who said it. My wife uh, told me that you said it to her when she was somebody was going to Israel and they asked whether they could stay another day or two, and he said that, that same thing. Right. Well, I've always followed that policy, and I think I began following it. You know, when we went for the first time to the Soviet Union, we actually went four times in '72, '75. That's where we became very, very close to Natan Sharansky and then again in 87, and then in 89. This brings me to a, a difficult period uh, in our history because uh, you were just a teenager during the Holocaust, but uh, it is said that America, Jewish community, it was not their best time. How do you remember it, and what happened? Perhaps because of my involvement in the Soviet Jewry movement, where basically I spent 20 years of my life, uh, I became very interested in American Jews and their response to the Holocaust while it was happening. And through the suggestion of Jerry Goodman, who was then uh, executive director of the National Conference on Soviet Jewry, I actually determined to write my doctoral dissertation on a comparison between the American Jewish response to the Holocaust while it was happening and the American Jewish response to the Soviet Jewry, uh, to the plight of Soviet Jews. My guide and mentor, uh, Professor Hyman Grinstein at Yeshiva, convinced me that I can't do both and that I should just write about the Holocaust because that's history, which was my subject, whereas Soviet Jewry was contemporary events. And so with the help of Elie Wiesel, I designed a study to look at what American Jews were doing or weren't doing publicly while six million were being murdered. And I found out what Elie Wiesel suspected, that life went on, unfortunately, as usual in America. Now, there were, there were lots of reasons for the muted response of American Jews, anti-Semitism, anti-alienism in the country. Separatism. Uh, lots of reasons. But what was most disturbing to me was that consistently through the Holocaust, we were conducting business as usual. American Jewry publicly was conducting business as usual. 
and not focusing on this huge tragedy that they knew was happening, because I demonstrated in my dissertation that the knowledge was there, but somehow the reaction wasn't there. There was no and that was, at the gate of the White House with uh, a torn... Unfortunately, unfortunately. And therefore, the lesson is what I said before. Whenever a Jew hurts anywhere, it has to hurt every Jew everywhere, or at least those Jews who are alive to this situation. Thank you. It is a difficult realization. I want to go to a different direction. Uh, talking about your experience with the Rav, the Rav said, and I paraphrase, the error of modern approach to religion is that it promises solutions to all the problems of life. The beauty of religion reveals itself to men not in solutions, but in the problems themselves. It posed that the grandeur of religion lies in its mysterium tremendum its magnitude and its ultimate incomprehensibility, where he said the study of Torah is an act of surrender. Can you elaborate on it, and how do you teach students to surrender to accepting problems without trying to solve them? This is too complicated for, uh, for a, an interview. Rav Salvechik always used to say to us, the most important thing is the question, not the answer. Funakasha Starpmanisht. You don't die from questions, and questions are the most important issue. When you question, then you search for answers, and searching for answers brings about very often blessed results. If you commit yourself to Torah and to knowledge and to philosophy and you work through issues, you may not find a, a, a solution, but you grow in the process. When he talks about surrender, the Rav was very, very big on total commitment. I remember him speaking about this in the 50s and 60s and 70s. And that's where we started this, this interview. Orthodox Judaism is a total commitment to a system, to halacha, to Torah, to learning. That's what makes us what we are. Uh, we don't necessarily find solutions to all the problems, but we are committed to a way of life. I know it's a big topic, but I like the way you take it, and if your permission, I'd like to extend it. You teach students to understand the text. The Rav was talking about commitment. Did he call for obedience, and is understanding and surrender not the opposite? Please talk about that. It's, it's so interesting how you put it in your words. I think the Rav went through two stages of thinking. His primary stage, which you see in his magnum opus, Ish HaHalacha, Halachic Man, is that commitment and surrender are essential. He used to say, uh, we all know that there are two types of laws in the Torah, chukim and mishpatim. A chok is a law whose reason we don't understand. A mishpat is a law whose reason we understand. A chok is kashras. A chok is nida and mikvah. A mishpat is shabbos, tzedakah. Fairness. Fairness, justice. He used to say in the 50s and 60s, that a chok is much more of a religious act than a mishpat. Because in a mishpat, you're really responding to your own will. You understand very well why you have to do it. In a chok, you're responding purely to God's will. And that's why it's a more religious act. So there's that idea of surrender, commitment. I think in the 1970s, he began to soften a little bit, maybe as he got older, and began talking about the meaning of mitzvos more so than he was doing in the 50s and 60s. Now, I may be oversimplifying, but I can tell you an anecdote. He has a beautiful story in Isha Halacha about his father, Ramosha Soloveitchik, going over to the Shamash in Yeshiva who, when he 
made the bracha over the shofar, broke down and cried. Asher He was crying over that bracha. And according to the Rav, Rav Moshe said to uh, uh, the Shamash after davening, Vas veinstu, what were you crying over? Do you cry when you make a bracha over a lulav? Do you cry when you make a bracha over a sukkah? Why are you crying? And I asked the Rav personally, sometime in the late 70s, maybe early 80s, I said, would you tell that same story again today? And he didn't really answer the question. And by his not answering the question, I made an assumption that that was his period of Yikov Hadin Esahar, the law, the chok, the commitment, the surrender is the main thing, and the most important thing in religion. And the inner spirit is not as important. And I think I saw a change in him somewhere in the 1970s and 80s. I could be wrong, and I could be oversimplifying the most profound Jewish thinker that I had the privilege of ever knowing or listening to or reading. Well, thank you. Rabbi, you're a modern Orthodox Jew with so many Jews now moving to the right, has this definition changed? Absolutely not. I'm going to say something controversial. I am not a theoretical pluralist. I am a practical pluralist. By that I mean, in theory, I believe the modern Orthodox way is right. Being part of the world, being a uh, at one with the world, and at the same time being a absolute Shomer mitzvot and Shomer Torah. I think that's what modern orthodoxy is about. I think ultra-orthodoxy has moved too much to the right and is not the correct way in which to live uh, a Torah life. I, I don't think the Rambam would have lived that way. Not so sure about the Vilna Gaon, but I don't think Maimonides or Nachmanides or Rabbi Yehuda Levi or uh, Rabbi Yitzchak Abravanel, I don't think they would have lived that way. I think our way is correct. I also do not think conservative Judaism and reform and Reconstructionism are right. This is in theory. I think our way, the middle way, is correct. Practically speaking, I am absolutely a practical pluralist. I believe we have all kinds of Jews who are going to live in all kinds of ways and feel honestly that they are practicing Judaism as they think is right. And I'm ready to honor everybody and work together with them and love everybody, as you said before, especially those with whom I don't agree, because it's no trick to love the Jews with whom you do agree. First of all, with the ultra-Orthodox moving further to the right, the center shifts naturally, because modern Orthodox have the word Orthodox in it, and they're afraid of looking behind the shoulder. Yeah. They won't be considered religious enough, especially with the problems that we see. But in particular, Yeshiva University, which was the bastion in the 50s of modern Orthodoxy, do you recognize it today as it was? It has turned, certainly has changed. No comment. <laughs> well, I'll take it a different direction, which will be easier. There was a time where keeping Judaism as it was, was the key for Jewish survival as a people. But today there is a threat that by holding to Judaism as it was, we may lose a large part of our people as Jews. So the question is a balancing act. Do we need to move with modernity, yet keeping Judaism unchanged? How do you bridge this gap? What is more important? I don't feel the need for Judaism to move. I was brought up and I've tried to bring up my children and also lead my community 
in a way that says, live in the modern world, be comfortable in the modern world, but always remember your absolute commitment to Torah and mitzvos and to Ahavat Yisrael and to Medinat Yisrael. And you don't have to move. It's not necessary to move. It's necessary to maintain your integrity and your commitment, your surrender, and to give meaning to your life. And being a practical pluralist. And be a practical pluralist, not a theoretical pluralist, a practical pluralist. On, on a different topic, you and other renowned rabbis were refused recognition to convert people to Judaism by an Israeli rabbinic court, which led to a controversy over just who, outside of the official Israel rabbinate, will have the conversion recognized in Israel, and it affects Jews all over the world. I know that you love all Jews, but how do you struggle and live with this development? I don't want to get you into a controversial area, but yeah. it is an issue that troubles people who make decisions based on it. I believe the way in which uh, conversions worked in America until about 10 years ago is the way in which they should continue to work. Sincere rabbis who practice halacha and love Torah and mitzvot should do the best they possibly can to convert people who want to become part of the Jewish people for whatever the reason is. And just as their conversions were honored until 10 years ago, they should be honored today. A centralized system is essentially a gatekeeping system to keep people out. We should not be gatekeeping. We should be welcoming. Thank God we live at a time when many non-Jews want to become Jewish, either because they want to embrace Judaism or because they want to embrace a Jew, which is okay, as long as they do it the right way. And if we're doing it the right way, which I believe I have been doing and many of my colleagues have been doing, their conversions should be honored. And just as I used to go years ago, somebody would come to me and say they were converted by Rabbi so-and-so. If I knew Rabbi so-and-so, I knew whether I could rely on him. And if I didn't know Rabbi so-and-so, I called Rabbi Israel Clavin, the executive director of the Rabbinical Council of America, and asked him, can I rely on him? And Rabbi Clavin said, yes, you can rely on him, or no, I think he's a little bit loosey-goosey with, with conversions. We did that, and most people were reliable. And I don't know why we don't have trust in honest, hardworking, sincere, orthodox rabbis who are trying to do a good job. Well, I think that you know that he's been politicized mainly because religious leaders are now part of the Israeli government, for whatever reason it is, and which had led to some Haredi control of religious institutions what does it mean to the future relationship between the different parts of the Jewish world and especially the relationship with Israel? My relationship to Israel is not going to change, of course. no matter what goes on in but, the chief rabbinate. But our, our institutional Jewish relationship, we are in, they say, the gates of Golag. You know, has, has there been, we know, history? I think we live in one of the most blessed periods in Jewish history. We are blessed with Medina Israel. We are blessed with a growing Torah world in the full range of that world. We are living in an America where we have all kinds of opportunities and freedoms. If, if you look at the history of the Jewish people, we were always at risk. We started out our uh, existence as slaves. We were like a fiddler on the roof in Poland for a thousand years. There were good times and bad times. The, the good times were terrible. We have none of that today. Do we have problems? Yes. 
we have very serious problems of assimilation, which are very troublesome. The, the, the Jewish population is dwindling. And it's only because of a very high rate uh, a birth rate in the Haredi world and a healthy birth rate in the modern Orthodox world and a healthy birth rate in Israel that we're not disappearing. So we certainly have problems, but we live at a time where compared to the rest of Jewish history, we are in a stage of Geula and we have to make sure that we love each other and stop fighting with each other. And remember what Rav Cook used to say, that which unites us is far greater than that which divides us. Ben Omar, Amen. Absolutely. One moment. Remembering similar periods, let's say in the return of the Bayacheni or the time of the Maccabi, do we learn any lessons from that uh, to apply today? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, ancient Jewish history well enough to be able to say something uh, significant and important. I've, I've spoken about it many times. So thank you for that. I have one thing that I ask the rabbis I, I interview uh -huh. to do at the conclusion, uh -huh. and that is to sing something from the tish of your poem or something meaningful from your life as a Jew, whether from your parents' home or from anything uh -huh. that is meaningful. My grandfather, my mother's father, the one who was born in America in 1882, used to have specials me wrote around the table. If I had to pick out one melody of his that my whole family knows, it's his Nusach for Ritze, which I believe probably comes from Krakow, where his parents came from in 1881. Vitzeh <laughs> Over at Sonach Hanach, Lano out of Shem, Elo Kenu, Shalos, a hate, Sorovia, Gon Vanacho, Beom Menucha, Sehenu, Vaharenu, Adonai, Elohenu, Benecham, Mastion, Irecho, Over Vinyan, Yerushalay, Emir, Kodshecho, Kiatahu, Balai, Shuos, Uvala, Nechomos. That's an anthem in my family. And it all goes back to a man who had very little Jewish education and only an eighth grade elementary school education here in the United States. My grandfather, Isidore Schlang, Sechron el Levracho, Yitzchak ben Yechezkel HaKohen, after whom a great grandchild was just named uh, on the day before Tisha B'Av. Mazel Tov for your new great-grandson. Thank you. That's wonderful. So now I understand why you like davening. If everything is like this, <laughs> what, right. it's easy. That's right. That's right. That's where it comes from. I thank you so much, Rabbi. Okay. You're welcome. Mm -hmm.